Hey everyone, it's Kristen Hawkins. Welcome to this new episode of the Explicitly Pro-Life Podcast. So today I'm going to bring you a conversation I just recently had on Facebook with my friend Mary Vogt. Mary and I met uh, about a few months back. We were connected by a mutual friend. In fact, I'm kind of surprised we haven't met years or, uh, earlier. Uh, but Mary's youngest daughter has cystic fibrosis, which two of my children, Gunnar and Gracie, have. So I asked Mary to come on to have a discussion about what it was like to get the diagnosis that your child has cystic fibrosis, what, you know, it's meant for her and her family, um, how they're handling uh, the COVID quarantine. And we also talk a little bit about some discriminatory practices in our healthcare system that are going on right now and are actually coming to light because of the current coronavirus crisis. Uh, Mary, you can follow her on Twitter. You can read her writings. Uh, She's often published in the Washington Post, the Washington Times. You can also follow her husband, Russ. Russ spoke at our National Pro-Life Summit this January in Washington, D.C. He is the uh, director of the Office of Management Budget for the Trump administration. So I hope you'll uh, listen into this discussion and maybe get a little bit of perspective about what it's like uh, to be uh, a mother, uh, to be a parent to a child with cystic fibrosis. May is CF Awareness Month, so I thought this would be a discussion you might be want to tune into. Thanks, guys. Hi everyone, and welcome to this fun Facebook Live. Uh, I'm Kristen Hawkins, president of Students for Life and Students for Life Action, and the host of the Explicitly Pro Life podcast. And tonight, um, I'm excited because we've got a good friend of mine, Mary Vote. She is joining me from her home in Arlington, Virginia. Um, hi, Mary. Hi. Thanks for having me. So, Mary, um, Mary and I um, actually met through a mutual friend. Uh, and I can't believe we didn't meet sooner because we kind of ran in the same circles in Washington and kind of knew a lot of the same people. But we were actually connected uh, about the topic we're going to talk about tonight, which is about cystic fibrosis. May is Cystic Fibrosis Awareness Month. And um, Mary and her husband, Russ, uh, her husband, Russ, uh, he spoke actually at the National Pro-Life Summit. If you signed up for the History Maker Virtual Summit Toolkit, you'll see uh, his speech was wonderful. Uh, Russ is the director of the Office of Management and Budget for the White House. So every once in a while, you'll see him on TV. Um, But Mary and I connected because we both are mothers of children with cystic fibrosis. And I thought tonight that we would kind of talk a little bit about what it means, uh, what cystic fibrosis is. You, Some of you all hear me talk about CF or you'll see me reference CF, maybe in an op-ed or a letter I've written. Um, but a lot of folks don't know what CF is. So I thought maybe today we'll talk about what CF is. And Mary and I can talk about our kind of our shared experiences that we've had as moms of kind of learning about this disease, um, the good, the bad, uh, some of the good news of what's on the horizon when it comes to research for cystic fibrosis and the advances that are being made. And I think we can also talk a little bit about what, what's happening with the coronavirus and protecting vulnerable populations, especially our children during this time. So Mary, I'm going to put you in the hot seat first. Um, Did you know a lot about CF uh, before you had your daughter? I didn't. I'm ashamed to say I didn't. And once I found out that she had CF, I didn't really, I didn't really know as much as I do now until she was born. Like Mm -hmm. I tried to read up on it. I looked online. I tried to have meetings with doctors, but really when she was born, then it was a crash course into what CF actually is. (laughs) Now, did you have uh, another child before you had your daughter with CF? Yes, I have two girls. My oldest daughter, Ella, is eight years old, and she does not have CF. And um, our youngest daughter, Porter, she just turned six in February. She has cystic fibrosis. Yeah, I mean, that, I think that's the pretty much same for Jonathan and I. When um, Gunnar was dying, well, well, when the doctor called and said that his newborn infant screen test, the marker, there's a... There's a newborn infant screen that many states require every child born in the state to go through kind of a blood test and screens for a number of genetic disabilities uh, and challenges a child might have. CF is one of those. And part of the newborn screen, there's a marker test for CF. It's not a conclusive test by any means, but it says there could there could be cystic fibrosis. And when the doctor called to tell us that he his screen came back positive, I was like, what are you talking about? I have no I I I, I can't believe I never even had heard of cystic fibrosis we almost 
Russ get tested again because I didn't believe that he was positive because they just kept telling us it was so rare. It was so rare. Your chances are so low. And so we have medical professional people in our family and they're like, he should get a second opinion. He should get tested again. <laughs> now you guys knew you and Russ knew in your pregnancy with Porter, right? That what she had CF. Yeah. 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 So um, Gunner, Jonathan and I did not know that Gunnar had CF or that Gracie ended up uh, whom our fourth child, our, our second child with CF had, had CF. Um, and so the way in sometimes people ask like, how, you know, how, how did your kid get CF? How did they contract it? Um, your, your child doesn't really contract CF. Uh, your child is born with cystic fibrosis. It's a, it's a genetic disease. So it's something that occurs in the genetic level, meaning my husband is a recessive carrier. Uh, and I'm a recessive carrier. I'm, we, my husband and I are both carriers for cystic fibrosis. And if you all remember your high school, like genetics, with like the four boxes, right? Um, so you, we have a 25% chance that every child that we, we would conceive could have cystic fibrosis. We have a 25% chance that every child we have w would, would not have CF and would not be a carrier, and a 50% chance that our child would just be a carrier. So in our home, we actually have two children with CF. Um, Bear, our second son, uh, he is not a carrier. And then Maverick, my third son, is a carrier. He has one recessive gene. So that's a little bit of high school genetics for everybody. Ella, our oldest, she is a carrier. So mm -hmm. she and that's something I think, you know, when you go, when you're pregnant, uh, you know, the first question they always asked me was like, how are you going to pay for this? And then they would say, like, do you want um, the screening test? And CF now is one of the common uh, tests that they do at the OB office, just like how they'll do an amniocentesis for Down syndrome. Um, now, we also know that there's a lot of false positives that occur. Tina Whittington, uh, my best friend and the VP of Students' Wife, her daughter actually was tested positive uh, through for Down syndrome and then was born without Down syndrome. Um, but that's it's, it is a little concerning. It's a blessing sometimes to be able to know up front if your child is going to be born with a genetic disability, especially with, with CF, because there's a chance that your child can be born with, um, how do you pronounce it? It's muconium... Yeah, alias, meconium alias. Yes, yeah. Thank you, Mary. Mary knows like all the fancy terms. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, there's about, I think it's about 10 to 15 percent chance that your child who has CF can be born with this, basically this meconium blockage. That's that that black kind of like, it's like that black stool babies kind of first kind of poop out right after they're born. And CF children, uh, they can have a blockage. And so that requires kind of like emergency hospitalization and surgery. Um, and it doesn't lead to, it doesn't kind of mean that there's going to be more issues that come up, but it's something to be aware of. So John and I didn't go through the genetic testing with our other children, but what we did do is we did a level two ultrasound. So about 35 weeks, I went in with the ultrasound and they just, just you know, looked at the intestines of my children to see, is there any blockages that we need to be aware of? Um, and then we ordered a genetic test at birth for our children. So we knew like day five uh, after Gracie was born that she had CF. So how did, um, I guess, Mary, when you found out, so when the doctor called to tell you and you were pregnant um, and you already had one pregnancy that didn't have a child with CF, which you had a different experience than me because my first child had CF. So it was like chaos from the start. Um, and I had bear, I was like, this is really easy. Um, but when you found out that Porter was going to be born with CF, what were kind of some of the emotions that, that went through your mind? So we went to a specialist that did some somewhat groundbreaking testing where he took my blood and he separated the child's DNA from my blood. And he, it wasn't patented information or technology yet. So it wasn't 100%, but he told us from his analysis that he thought she most likely had it. So mm -hmm. we didn't have her for sure, but we kind of knew. Mm -hmm. So we knew what to look for going into the pregnancy and the delivery. Um, so we actually went to children's hospital and toured the pulmonary facility there. We met with the top pulmonologist there mm -hmm. and tried to learn as much as we could to become prepared. Um, Porter was actually born five weeks early with oh. conium ileus that you mentioned. So she had the tornado. That's illness. why you can say it because. <laughs> yeah. Yes, we lived it. We lived it. So um, it's funny because when we were in the NICU, she was in the NICU for over 30 days mm -hmm. when she was 
was born and the doctor got the genetic test results that she confirmed that, that, you know, she had cystic fibrosis. And he thought that he was telling us for the first time that she had CF. And we pretty much knew, we knew already from the, te- we pretty much knew from the testing prior, but then with the meconium elias, we're like, definitely she has it. Mm-hmm. And just, he was so nervous and, you know, he was young and he felt like he was going to break our hearts. And I just felt like I needed to hug him. I was like, no, it's fine. We know it's okay. Like, don't worry about it. Um, so yeah, it was just kind of, it was just like drinking from a fire hose. There was so much information. Um, one thing that I find that's hard about cystic fibrosis is that it is so complex. (laughs) If your Mm -hmm. kid the bone, they, they have a pattern of steps that they do to set the bone, put the cast on, they treat it with CF. It's not really a science and you're having to guess and change medication and try alternate things. And so there's just so much that you need to learn and be brought up to speed on that. It's very overwhelming. And so I think early on, your emotions don't really come out or it doesn't affect you because you're trying to consume so much information and make sure that you get everything right. I don't know if that was how it was for you, but for me, I was just taking copious notes, making sure I didn't miss any details and just trying so hard to get my head wrapped around what this new life for us meant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I think it kind of affects you parents and people differently, you know, in moments of crisis. Um, I, rem- I remember very clearly when the doctor called to tell us that Gunnar had CF, uh, the screaming that went on in my home. Um, and, and it was very shocking for my husband and my mom was there. And it was, it was, it was, it was a very difficult day. Um, but then it, you know, instantly it was, we got to get in the car. We need to go to the doctor. We need to find out what is exactly going on, what medicine needs to be on. You know, we were in the, you know, at the doctor's office within an hour and a half. And then we were at children's hospital in DC the next, you know, I think the next day or the day after, uh, and then we were at another hospital, WVU, their hospital. And then I started researching all the hospitals in the country and calling all the different CF centers. And so, um, it kind of depends on, I think on your person too of how do you how do you kind of compartmentalize that sort of information and, and do you just kind of okay buckle down and, and then then the kind of the emotions will catch up to you at some point or do the emotions immediately come out and I think it just depends on you as a person um, and but you're right I had I remember I had like a binder that I used for students for life and all my and I just like the whole back of that binder I mean I just every word they were saying I was writing down as fast as I possibly could and like for the first two years of Garner's life like every time we went to the doctor I was just taking notes every, everything and then I was writing down the weight and I'm like I don't really need to write down his weight because I got in the computer like I can just call them and ask them you know and now it's electronic and I can just go online and look um, but it is it's very overwhelming and there's a lot of information for us it was hard because we were new parents too so you know we were trying to deal with being parents and then you know, I didn't even know Gunner was like three months. It was St. Patrick's Day when Gunner was diagnosed. So um, it was three months. So he he had been throwing up and he had all this acid reflux. And we just thought, well, they said babies spit up and they poop a lot, but didn't realize it was, he was pooping immediately after he ate because he couldn't, his his body couldn't, you know, absorb the nutrients that was going in. Right. Um, And so he needed those enzymes. And so I, I felt really, I had a lot of guilt personally of, I wish I would have known, like, I, I should have known there was something wrong with him before we got to this point, because had I already been a mom um, and had an, a child who didn't have CF, I would have recognized this isn't normal. Like there's something else going on here. Um, and so there was like that kind of guilt that you have to deal with as well. Um, so what do you think? Um, I guess. I had a hard time when Gunner was diagnosed and then we would go home and see our family. Uh, and it was hard because I felt like other people just didn't get it. Um, did you ever, did you ever have challenges like that? of like trying to communicate with friends or family? Like, no, 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 you don't understand. You've had strep throat or you had a cold. Like you really can't, like, I'm not going to let you come into my house. Yeah, definitely. One of the obstacles I think is that the kids generally look very healthy from the side. And so they just, people continually say, well, she looks really good. She looks really healthy. And I think they're trying to encourage you and make you feel good about the effort that you're putting into helping them. 
but in reality, it's in the lungs, it's in their genes, it's in their body. And, you know, they don't always see the ugly side of it. And they don't know what a common cold or flu mm-hmm. or pneumonia can do to their lungs. And so, yeah, you're kind of a broken record at some point where you're, you know, you're saying like, uh, I'm sorry, you're not feeling well, we're not going to be able to come or, you know, please don't come over if you're not feeling well, or if you've had a fever and you, it's, it's hard because you feel bad, but you just, you're the only advocate for your child. So you have to just continually say that and remind people because they, they just don't think like that. Yeah. And I think that's something that, you know, like when I, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, it's just a little bit of dirt. Like, it's okay. I'm like, no, it's really not okay. Like, I'm glad that you don't have to, to worry about this, but I have to worry about this. And you're right. I am the advocate for my child. And I think that was one of the lessons. I don't know. Has Porter ever been hospitalized for an exacerbation? Not an exacerbation, but she did culture a bad um, lung bacteria when she was two or three. And so she was hospitalized. Mm-hmm. For that, and then um, at another time when she was just really sick and we just couldn't keep her well. So. Yeah, no, I, that that's what's so surprising to me is, yes, they can look completely healthy, and something can change instantly. Like last March, Gunner got sick. I was here in my office working. I heard him throwing up. My husband said it's fine. I got him drinking Gatorade. I went out of my office about five o'clock. He looked pale. Why? I was like, something's wrong. I took his blood sugar because Gunner has, um, he's has impaired glucose intolerance. So he's very close to being diagnosed with CF-related diabetes, which is another complication that adds to the mortality rate, uh, something we're really trying to stop him from getting. Um, and so we, I took his blood sugar, it was really bad. I called his doctor in Chicago um, and they were like, go to the emergency room. And I mean, he was, we were in the hospital for five days and he, he was you know, perfectly fine. And the doctors at the hospital were like, this is what happens if someone's been throwing up for eight days, his body's shutting down, he has acidosis, like, I'm like, oh, he's only been throwing up for 12 hours, you know, and so it, there's just these unexplained things that happen. Um, And it was actually, it was a form of the coronavirus that, that Gunner got. So he was totally fine. And then he wasn't. And then they were arguing with ICU. And we, you know, I was up for like 50 hours because we, he was in the emergency room and ICU didn't want him. But then the pulmonary ward didn't want him. Like, you know, it, it was crazy. But you have to be the advocate. I mean, that's like the number one thing I've learned. Gunner's been hospitalized twice now. Um, Gracie was hospital, has been hospitalized twice. Is you have to be the advocate. If your child's in the hospital, if your child has any special, like, needs, you can't be afraid to be that um, forthright person uh, at the hospital uh, to advocate and be like, no, this isn't right. My son isn't going to take this medicine. Here, I'll just pull the medicine I brought from home that you said I wasn't allowed to bring. We'll do that. Um, and so you got to be, you have to be a little pushy. Uh, you have to be a little pushy. So um, yeah, but I don't know. I, that, that for me, I think Mary was like the hardest thing with like dealing with family of like, I think for the first Christmas, I bought everyone a book about what CF is. I think only one person read it. Um, um, but I, I think that's, um, one of the, one of the challenges that you have of, you know, when people kind of make fun of you for having hand sanitizer or always washing your hands and being like overly protective. Um, I'm like, well, you don't, you don't live this life and you're not trying to protect someone who's medically vulnerable. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, how do you think about um, like the current c- coronavirus? So like, it's kind of, for me, I've been, I, my husband said that when we went into quarantine March 13th, he was like, Oh, now the rest of the world gets to see how I feel and live every single day of my life. Um, but like, how did that like affect you all? Yeah, no, definitely. One positive thing I think about the pandemic is that people are actually starting to pay attention to their own personal health hygiene. And so we don't feel so crazy anymore. It's like, yes, if you're sick, you should stay at home. You shouldn't go to work. You shouldn't get on the metro. Yes, you shouldn't be coughing on people. You know, wash your hands, use sanitizer, don't shake hands. It's very common sense stuff that we've been practicing for a while. It's all we know. And we do feel like the odd person out, mm-hmm. but, um, yeah, it's, it's informing other individuals. And now there's a heightened sense of personal health hygiene that hopefully won't leave when the pandemic leaves. Hopefully people will realize, okay, there are vulnerable people among us. We need, if we're sick, we should stay home. 
yes, we will miss that party or event, or we have to take a day off work, but we need to protect people around us. So it's uh, the, the pandemic, the quarantine time. I mean, it goes up and down. It's obviously hard to miss out on things. Um, but we're, like you said, we're used to it. We're used to with BF not going to Chuck E. Cheese birthday parties or <laughs> big public. Oh I always sweat when I get that invite and I just like, oh. no. um, you know, big public events or, you know, during flu season or really bad colds that are going around the girls' school, we just stay home. We don't do a lot of things that we know that could put us at risk. And so we're mm -hmm. just used to our plans always being in flux and that's hard that's generally not my personality type before having a child with CF I was very type a very measured everything planned and it's just caused me to be like okay everything happens for a reason we just need to roll with it and so it stinks that we're missing out on a lot of things we can't see our school friends we're doing work and school differently um, you know, we're missing out on family members, but it's just what we need to do and it won't be forever. And eventually we'll get past it. So I'm just, I'm trying to stick with that positive <laughs> mindset, but every day is different. So ask me in a few days. Well, you, I mean, you had it worse than I did because you and I were texting kind of when we both went into quarantine, you, because of Russ's job and the, the administration kind of being like an essential employee, Russ actually had to go, well, he got like an Airbnb, right? Like, so to not bring the potential coronavirus back home. Yeah, because he was working so much on the coronavirus task force and he was interacting with just in a lot of individuals mm -hmm. with Bob and people that he manages, we just thought it would just be too risky. And we had talked to doctors and got their advice and they had said it would just be better if he rented a separate place and separated from you all so you could be at home and really contain yourself and protect the order. And that was early on that we decided that because we just weren't so sure how the virus affected young children. And I think we're learning a little bit more about it and about how it affects people with CF. But we just, we didn't know. And so we just, it, it was sad. It was a hard goodbye when we had to say that he was going to be staying somewhere else. Yeah. A lot of time we did, you know, to supplement that. But He's back home now, which is great. And, um, you know, it's, we are glad to have him back and it's been great, but, you know, families, lots of families have to do this. People that have had chemotherapy, fighting cancer, you know, weakened immune systems, they have to do the same things that we do. And so it's easy to just kind of wallow in it and be upset and be angry at the situation, but that doesn't really affect it. Um, I'm also a big believer that as adults and parents, we have a responsibility to protect the, you know, the childlike innocence of our kids and to not put those adult size anxieties onto them. And so really just having to be like, okay, this is going to be great. It's going to be as normal as possible for them. It kind of kept me going. So, yeah. Um, it, that, I think to me, that was one of the things that I, to be honest, I was a little frustrated by of some folks, like even friends of mine online, when, you know, the quarantine started coming down. And, you know, the administration say, you know, saying, okay, we're, you know, two, it was 15 days to slow the spread, and it was 30 days to slow the spread. And I was actually on a call with the vice president, and there were like 30 of us. And it wasn't like a you know, structured conference call. So like, everybody's background noise was on, and everyone was asking questions. And, and I, I felt so bad because, you know, all the questions that the vice president were getting from these national conservative leaders were, when are we going to open up the government? We're killing the economy. Like, we got to do, you know, and I, I remember I emailed, you know, Paul and I said, you know, just thank the president and the vice president for doing this, um, because even my friends were, were pretty upset uh, about the quarantine and the restrictions. And um, I, I think that's something that it's um yeah, if you don't have a family member who's who's vulnerable and if you're not fearful that the coronavirus could take your life or your child's life, then I could see how, you know, yeah, I how dare the government tell me I can't do what I want to do. Um, but then if but, but, but the shoes on the other foot and you have a family member who is vulnerable, um, I, there's certainly a different response to the quarantines. And, and yes, it's painful and it's hard. And a lot of us are suffering the economic impact and will continue to suffer the economic impact of the quarantines. Um, but I think it's, I think it's an interesting testament that 
Americans still care about about the vulnerable, that we still want to protect the weak. Um, you know, even you had Governor Cuomo of New York, who, I mean, this is the man who lit up the One World Trade Center pink to celebrate, you know, signing into the law, the, a bill that allows abortions up to the moment of birth last year, you know, lecturing the American people every day and his, his citizens to stay home and to protect the most vulnerable and to protect p- people like his mom. Um, so I think it still shows that we as Americans still care uh, about the about the most vulnerable, even if there's like, you know, for what? Well, we talk about a lot with abortion. There's a fundamental disconnect that that goes on there, and you know, just that disconnect of not really understanding that that preborn child is a human being and a human being who has the same dignity and value as we do. So, um, so I don't know. I just I'm I'm still like I still see some comments. I don't know. Did you were you upset like? Because I know you're in the same kind of world, and I mean, I'm sure you've got friends who are on like social media and. I don't know, I was like personally upset. Like I had to stop myself a couple of times from like going on and like really just like letting them have it on Facebook comments. Uh, it's hard. I think there's, it's a fine line and there's a balance and, you know, I feel the pressure for our leaders. They have to make these decisions that affect all of us. But yeah, it's hard when, you know, early on we're like trying to stay inside for a short term so that we can all eventually get back outside again. And pe- some people didn't really abide by that. It's definitely frustrating. Um, but on the other side, it's hard when you see some governors now that just seem to be somewhat drunk on the power that they're given and just the lockdowns and you know mm-hmm. arresting individuals for going to the parks. And we're just seeing the flip side of it too. And that's, that's frustrating and infuri- infuriating. And so... Yeah, early on, I do think in our community and our neighbors and with our friends that most people were really supportive and they tried to abide by the rules, um, you know, and they tried to, they reached out, they wanted to check in and see how we were doing and see if we needed anything. And that was great. And that was encouraging because I think it's easy in these moments to feel like you're alone and that you're doing it all by yourself. And so, um, yeah, when someone like that would reach out to me, I would try to think of like, who else could I reach out to that may not have anybody or may not have been checked in on? So I thought it was a good feeling. I did feel like we weren't doing it alone after that. Yeah, no, I, yeah, it's definitely true that right now, and we'll see how kind of these lockdowns continue and the governors are kind of going overboard. Uh, But it is, it's actually very scary for us because it's, well, when do when do we go? Do we go on our camping trip in two weeks? I mean, we really won't be around people. We'll be in a camper. <laughs> like, we'll be hiking. But do we do it? Like, you know, there's a lot of questions of, but then what happens when I do have to travel? And, and I can't just, you know, say no to that speaking engagement or event um, because eventually I will have to get back on a plane. And, and what does that mean? Um, and so there are, I think, a lot of unknowns and a lot of scariness for families who have CF or dealing with other kind of medical issues, cancer or any 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 person, vulnerable person. Um, I think the other thing that the coronavirus kind of showed us, too, is that there's some, I mean, we, we there is healthcare rationing that happens in America. There's healthcare rationing that happens all over the world. Certainly, America, I believe we have one of the greatest healthcare systems in the world, and that's because of our democracy. Um, it's because of free market capitalism. But um, there is healthcare rationing that happens, um, and there was a lot of discussion, kind of as we were going into the lockdowns, of what will happen if there's not enough ventilators. Um, who who will get the ventilators, who won't get the ventilators. There was a lot of talk about what was happening in Italy. Um, I actually had an article up in The Federalist. It was published this week um, uh, talking about that because there were some states that had some pretty, like, just old rules in place of, you know, if there's a ventilator shortage, that essentially people with CF, there was about five states that listed CF as one of the conditions that, if there's a ventilator shortage, people with CF wouldn't qualify for a ventilator. Um, and it's it just, you know, one state, uh, actually, the state of Alaska found out about it, and the governor, actually, he's pro-life, already fixed it and was like, oh, yeah, let's change this. And the CF Foundation came out and said, this is crazy. Like, they're operating under, you know, um, very outdated information. Um, but we still got to talk about because there's four other states that still technically have these kind of regulations on the books. And um, something just happened in New York. Uh, Gunnar Siasen came out and wrote something this week. Um, it was actually the same day as my thing. That It was like two things in one day. It was 
uh, Department of Health informed all the adults uh, who are on the state. Is it the state? It's the state Medicaid, right? Yeah, it's the CF Adult Assistance Program. And so they just they put forward their budget for the state of New York. And the budget cost $177 billion. And this program only cost $380,000. And they cut the program. So it was to help adults with CF to be able to stay at work and continue to get their health insurance. And the irony of it all is it's actually fiscally responsible because it ensures that those individuals don't then get put on Medicaid or that the states have the medical liability costs on the back end. And so... Um, yeah, it's it's a, the amazing thing with CF or having a child with a disability or an illness is that how you always have to be on top of advocating for them. You mm-hmm. think, like, oh, of course, everyone wants to help them or all the doctors like this is common sense. But like you said, there's these archaic laws that just fly mm-hmm. under the radar that nobody pays attention to until you need a ventilator machine. Or this, like there's adults in New York that are that are fighting CF, like trying to survive and then up oh, their legs are cut out from under them with this program. And so it's amazing how you, you really, there's no rest for the weary. You have to pay attention 100% because you are your child's advocate and you need to be able to say something to fix it. Otherwise it will just stay the same. Yeah, I mean, I think that to me is very frustrating. Sometimes we'll have discussions with, uh, uh, students for life leaders who are, or pro-life leaders who um, are progressive or liberal. And so I'll hear the argument of, well, you know, yeah, I'm pro-life. I understand abortion is violence. It kills an innocent human being. We totally agree. And I, and I'm so pro-life. I'm for, you know, I believe healthcare is a fundamental human right and the government should provide everyone with healthcare, quality healthcare. Right. And I'm like, Okay, so let's take a step back. Let me talk to you about something called qualies. Uh, let's talk about uh, healthcare rationing. Let's talk about what happens in Great Britain and other nations, um, because there aren't uh, examples of governments that take care of everyone's medical needs and pay for a top-notch healthcare, and where there's rationing that doesn't happen because the government sets a budget, and this is what happens in Canada. This is what happens in Great Britain, and when that budget is met. Uh, when there's no more knee replacements for the year, there's no more hip replacements. You're back on the wait list for the new year because, oh, we met, we hit our budget in October and we can't go over. Um, and we've seen firsthand. Um, and Mary, do you want to talk a little about like what some of the stuff we've seen maybe in Great Britain with the Orcambi, with the drug um, expiring on the shelf? there's people with CF and other countries that are continually posting videos, posting things on social media, begging pharmaceutical companies to get them the drug so they can try it on their last leg, trying to get access to the drug. And, you know, we're fortunate that we have that access here in America and that our kids can get that. But it's heartbreaking when you see a kid the same age as your kid, you know, holding these signs in a hospital bed had been there for several months, just asking to get access to a drug. Mm And it's completely heartbreaking. And we live in the greatest country in the world. And we have the most brilliant medical experts and scientists working overtime to come up and innovate and mm-hmm. you know, put these drugs on the market to make a difference. And you, I don't wanna live anywhere else. I mean, I wanna be able to have access to these drugs for my daughter and for her future. And it's absolutely heartbreaking. These parents mm-hmm. are pleading with the government to try to get access to this medication because they're seeing stories in America and how it's changing people's lives. Mm-hmm. You know, people who have been in the ICU on oxygen tanks are now swimming laps in a pool. And so they want that for their kid. And just the system that is set up is so flawed for mm-hmm. the individual and for those with disabilities that are sick that it's mm-hmm. it's it's heartbreaking to watch. And that's what happens at every time healthcare becomes socialized medicine. Anytime the, the state, the government takes control of your healthcare and says, we are gonna administer all healthcare. We're gonna be, we're gonna decide who gets what. That's exactly what happens. Those who are the most vulnerable, those who have the most expensive medical illnesses, those who ha- have a reduced life expectancy are the ones who suffer. And that happens every single 
time, like without exception. So what happened in Great Britain, it was, uh, I think it was last, last March, there was a story. So a drug that Gunner has been on since it was in study. So Gunner, we were living in Minnesota. We were flying back and forth to Dartmouth. Uh, so up to New Hampshire because a drug or combi, which is a genetic modifier. So it's like one of the first drugs in the history of the world that literally corrects a genetic defect. Uh, Gunner got into the study. He was one of like 50 50 kids in the world in this six to it was a six to twelve year old study. We flew back and forth for this drug. Gunner was on it the whole you know, 24 study weeks, and then he was in the rollover, and then got approved. And your daughter's on it now. She's on Simdico. Oh, she's yeah. On Simdico. yeah, she's on. She's on the next gen. That's even better. Um, and so uh, Gunner was at, on this drug years. So Gunner's been on this drug, so he's 11. So he was on our combi, and now he's actually in Trikafta trial, which is amazing and way better. Um, and we can talk about that next. But so Gunner was on this drug for five or six years, and there were adults in Great Britain who, um, until like this fall, couldn't get this drug. And this drug isn't even, or can be, it's like the second gen. So Gunner's now on the fourth gen, and it is like, 10 times better than what Orcombi was. And the, the, the government, so the NHS, the National Health Service, was refusing, refusing to negotiate with Vertex Pharmaceuticals, a pharmaceutical company based in here in Boston, in the United States and Boston, developed the drug who spent millions and you know hundreds of millions of dollars in research to try to figure out how to like crack this code. Uh, the government refused to pay it because they said it was too expensive for how too few sufferers of CF in, in Great Britain. Um, and it's unbelievable because we know this drug, it's not like a cure. Gunner, there's there the first drug was uh, Clydeco, which Gunner didn't qualify for. And then there was our combi. Now Porter's on Simdeco, which is the upgrade for combi. And then there's Trikafta, which is the triple modulator. It's like Simdeco plus another pill. And it's way better. Uh, we're really excited by that. It's been doing some cool things. Um, so there's been four generations of this drug, and every time this drug has been developed here in America. It's been tested here in America. Americans have had, you know, the first access to it. It's not a cure, but they actually believe that if a child can get on Trikafta, so the drug that Gunner is just now on, he started the study in December. Many of you all were praying for Gunner because um, he almost got kicked out and he's back in. Um, but this drug, they believe if it, a young child can get on this drug, they may never have the lung damage that CF people have so because every year if when you have cf your lungs get more damaged every year and that's how eventually you'll you'll get to the point where you're on oxygen you'll be required or you'll need a lung transplant right um and so the goal is to keep your lungs as healthy as possible for as long as possible but with trikafta we may be able to keep their lungs healthy gunner actually had a um x-ray mary i didn't even tell you this uh, right before we were on the quarantine gunner's x-ray looked absolutely normal so gracie who's um she's gonna be five next week gracie's on our combi she's on our combi since she's two so gracie had the little like I, I forget what they call it but it's like the little lining on the outside of lungs it's common in cf patients gracie had that and gunner used to have that gunner who just turned 11 had nothing they were like you would never know gunner had cf unless someone told you Gunner's weight, he actually just had grown two different uh, clothing sizes. Like they are probably gonna have to reduce his enzymes um, because he's gained so much weight, so. So great, I mean, so I think the Washington Post called it the miracle drug. Like it's, and it came out quicker than anyone expected. It came out in the fall and October. And I really do think that's due to our president and him, right. and the FDA, telling them to fast track drugs, mm -hmm. put pressure on them, wanting these drugs to come through the pipeline. And, you know, as a parent, you're just there on the FDA website, watching and looking, getting all the releases, waiting for these drugs to come out. I mean, I'm waiting until Porter can, when they approve Trikafta for her age group. It'll be this fall, probably. Yeah, I'm just, you know, we've heard so mm -hmm. many great stories about it. And I... Um, in January, Porter got sick. She had a cold. And, you know, it just means extra treatments, extra oral medications, extra steroid, just everything on top of her normal baseline routine is just, you know, expanded on. And at one point, she was just so sick of it and so tired. And she said, Mom, I just hate, I hate that I have to take all this medication. I hate that I have to do all these things. 
which is just like a knife to your heart when you're a mom. But I told her, I said, you know, we need to look at it as not, I have to do these things, but I get to do these things because Mm -hmm. you get to do this physical chest, physical therapy and inhale these medications and take these pills and these enzymes because people worked hard to create them. And we live in the greatest country in the world where you can access them. Now that might have, may have been too much for her six year old brain, but <laughs> I'm trying to get her to realize like she, this is a blessing that she has access to these drugs, to these therapies that are helping her and improving her life. No, that's, that's perfect. I, I try to do the same thing with our kids, you know, cause they, they all go through this. Like I hate, I hate these best treatments are getting in my way. Like we were in, um, we took our camper because of CF, we became camper people. So we didn't have to go into hotel rooms. So now we have a camper uh, and I no, we don't have to worry about germs when we're traveling now. But when we went to Disney World this year, um, you know, I would get up at 3.30 in the morning to get both breathing treatments going because, you know, we were crazy and mom had, you know, type A mother had to schedule and we had things we wanted to get done before it got too hot because I didn't want the kids with CF to be sweating too much. So I wanted to be out of the sun. So, you know, we were there at 6 a.m. when the parks opened, but that meant we had to get up at 3 a.m. to do breathing treatments and everyone went to bed at like eight o'clock it was great but uh it was it was hard and so you have to make these sacrifices um but it's not yeah you're exactly right it's not why do i have to it's i get to be able to and, and how lucky that we are and that our children are uh that that they were born here in america they were born as americans and they get to live in this healthcare system and there are flaws and it's definitely not perfect but it is the best in the world. And I think when, you, when you're when you having these conversations with friends, um, when you're talking about, I'm sure, you know, as the election heats up, uh, there's gonna be a lot of talk about healthcare. And I, I would encourage all of you to think about what is it that you can get here that you, you're not gonna get in another country or who can get treatment here that isn't gonna get that treatment in another country because you don't have to look very far. You don't have to dig too deep into Google um, to see these stories of ration care. And in fact, there's people here in the United States and what we just talked about earlier with the case in New York State, there's people now who work in state governments who are trying to refuse, you know, if you're on Medicaid, you not they've, they've tried to deny or combi and saying these genetic modifiers are too expensive. You know, uh, there was a, a study that came out in February that was basically saying, you know, there's qualities, a quali- uh, quality adjusted life years. And they came up with a mathematical calculation for every person. And if you had CF, you automatically got like your qualities deducted from you. If you had CF and CF related diabetes, which is a complication of CF, it's not like type one or type two, it's different, that you got an extra like 10 years taken off of you. And so they did these qualities and then they actually said that even if Trikafta, this miracle drug, even if Trikafta was curative, it still wouldn't be worth the cost because it's about $300,000 a year. It would not be worth the cost. Even if it cured my children of CF, it wouldn't be worth the cost. And this was an American think tank here in America, trying to influence American public policy on healthcare. Yeah, it's absolutely mind blowing. And you're right, the election matters. (laughs) These type of policies matter because individuals that have disabilities or the sickest among us are just at the exact same value as individuals that don't. And when we see economic studies by, you know, these brilliant economists that are putting a value on an individual's life just because they are in a wheelchair or they have cystic fibrosis, it's ridiculous and it's not the way of America and it's not the way that our country should be. So you're right, the election matters and these type of policies that we see coming from the left and from the Democrats are really scary. I mean, we look to the pandemic and how we've been, you know, COVID-19 and this situation to, to see that exactly. Like the people can remember like ex- the situation and how that affected them and the healthcare that they were provided during that to know that it matters who's in charge and who, who's in the White House. Absolutely, and I think it's so important. Um, uh, I guess, Mary, to close out, what would you, you know, if, if you, if someone's watching this and their child has a medical disability illness, of uh, someone in their family, what would what kind of advice would you want to give them right now? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, first off, I would say that we see you. I think sometimes it's very lonely and it's a very hard, difficult task caring for a loved one and it's exhausting. 
but there are people that see you and are there and have gone through the exact same thing and you don't have to do it alone. So mm -hmm. find a community, find others that um, you can reach out to and get advice. Um, you know, I've told people at our hospital that if there's anyone that is carrying a baby and they find out it has cystic fibrosis, like put me in touch with them. I will talk to them. Yes, mm -hmm. it's very overwhelming at first and mm -hmm. the thought of your entire life changing is drastic, but the joy that you get from that child and, um, helping them live life to the fullest and protecting them. You know, I just feel honored that I'm called to be Porter's mother. And it's not mm -hmm. ideal and it's not easy, but I'm grateful that she has access to these medications and that she's having a chance to live. And, you know, I have yet to meet someone with CF that hasn't wanted to live, <laughs> that, you know, wanted to be aborted. And so um, her life is just as valuable as anybody else's, just the same as, as your children. And so I would just say that you don't need to go at it alone and you can do it. You are a strong individual, and you you can do it. You can you can get through it, and you will make a huge difference. And it will really impact you more than the children. I think the perspective that it's given me, although I would never have asked for it, and I would take it away from my child in a heartbeat, as I know you would. It's just given you an outlook on life that you that is just so unique and different to who you were before. And it's hard to say that, but it's true, and how it affects you, and your outlook, and how. You look at other individuals that are suffering or other humans that have hardships or others that are going through health conditions. And it's just given me this perspective that it's hard to put into words, but it, 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 it's helped me in my life as a human being. So, yeah. I mean, how many times have we heard that of, you know, I hear along campuses of, well, you know, if a child's going to suffer, if someone's going to suffer, it's just better off to abort them. And I think that's, it's just such a fundamentally flawed statement because everyone's going to suffer, right? So that's, that's a, you, how can you say that? Because every single person's going to suffer. You don't know. And even if you don't see someone suffering, they may be suffering. So, um, and I think it's also this, it comes from this thought of like that all suffering is e evil and suffering isn't evil. It's like, it's, it's neutral. It's how you react to the suffering, right? How do you, how do you deal with the suffering? How do you behave in face of suffering is either good or is bad. And I, I think that we, we see all suffering um, as like this evil thing that has to be avoided at all costs. And, and you can't avoid suffering. That's part of our human experience, but suffering changes you. It, and it, and it, and you, and you can, it, use it to change for the better. You're absolutely right. Like you're not the person you were before you found out Porter at CF. I'm not the person I was before I found out I was a mom to Gunner who had CF. Um, you know, everything I thought I like was important for Gunner's life. Like I really, you know, I, I always, would, I, would, I remember being pregnant and stressing out about like, would he be good at school? Would he like school? Like I like school, what kind of college you'd like to go to. And I literally could care. I mean, we homeschool now. I'm like, I don't care. Like, if you want to go to community college, fine. Like if you want to work with mom for the rest of your life, that's great. Like I don't care because it's about, do you have a happy and fulfilled life? And do you know your purpose for your life, which is to serve God? Like, do you know that? Like, that's the most important thing. It's not about your GPA. It's not about the college you go to. That's, and I think a lot of times when we're on campuses um, and we hear this argument of like, why, you know, oh, well, if, if you're diagnosed with, with, with a board, with, um, CF or Down syndrome, of course, abortion should be an option. In fact, some studies are saying it's like 95% of children who are diagnosed with CF uh, in, in through their pregnancy are actually aborted. Um, and it's because of this notion of, well, they may not live as long as I'll live, or um, they're going to have to do these breathing treatments for two to four hours a day, or they it may be hard for them to breathe at times, but that doesn't mean their life doesn't have value and that their experience doesn't matter and the difference they're going to make on this world and the difference they're going to make on you. I think it's, I think sometimes for us, it's very, it's a scary thing for us. It's a scary thing for the moms. It's a scary thing for the dads because you as a parent have absolutely no control and you're a type A person. I'm a type A person. I like to have control in all things. Uh, I like to know what's coming and I don't have control as to what CF does to my children's bodies. I can control 
their breathing treatments, I control their medication, the calories they're intaking, the doctor's appointments. There's certain things I can control, but not everything. And we just don't know. And I think it it requires you to 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 remember that it's not really up to you and your life really isn't under your control. It's under someone else's control. Yeah, that, that, that's beautifully said. That's absolutely it. That's right. And so I remember just with my first daughter and the, is she hitting these milestones? Is she doing the right things? Is she doing this? And it just all went out the window with Porter. It's just like, is she doing her treatments? Is she doing her medication? Is she stooling when she needs to? Yeah. And so it, you know, I think I could have been a very OCD mother and setting these goals and milestones for them, but it's not what matters at the end of the day. And Mm -hmm. I have a responsibility given to me by God to Mm -hmm. raise up to be a godly woman. And so that's what matters. And so I need to take care of her and protect her to the best of my ability. But you're exactly right. Like that you said it, it was, it's beautiful. So yes, thank you. So for someone who doesn't like to talk about our feelings, I'm talking about my feelings. I, my entire staff, I think, is watching this. They're all excited about that. The, no, the comment I got was, keep keep doing this. Keep it up. Well, so, it's yeah. hard. Sometimes it's easy to talk about. People will ask me, and sometimes it's really hard to talk about. It just really depends. But, you know, you never know who's listening and who needs to hear it and who needs to be encouraged by it. So thank you for being willing to tell your story. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, it is. It is. It's weird. It's sometimes it's easy to talk about, and sometimes I'm like, I don't want to talk about this right now. Um, and so why are you asking me? Stop. Ta- stop mm-hmm. asking. Me. I'll volunteer information. Um, <laughs> so thank you for sharing your story and a little bit about your family with us tonight, Mary. Um, and y'all, um, you need to follow Mary. She's got a pretty active Twitter. Uh, she's on Instagram as well. But she's she's. You'll often find her like writing op eds. Uh, and with different kind of articles and kind of issues around, you know, the conservative movement. So um, where can folks kind of get in contact with you? What's kind of the best way so they can stay up to date with your family and all that you're doing? Yeah, they can follow me on Twitter. It's just me, at Mary Vogt. It's um, V-O-U-G-H-T. And I post a lot of my writings there and things. That's probably the best way. Yeah. Awesome. Well, um, yeah, thanks, Mary, for coming on tonight and tell your children thanks for their time with their mom. I find her like standing outside wondering when I'm going to go say goodnight to them. So I have to go, everyone. But thank you for joining us tonight and kind of hearing a little insider uh, uh, baseball of what it's like to be a mama to someone with CF and a little bit of information about cystic fibrosis for May, which is Cystic Fibrosis Month, Awareness Month. Um, Make sure you wash your hands. Don't go outside and go around other people if you're sick even after corona because you you don't know who you're around and you don't know uh how you and maybe you, you know your little science infection isn't a big deal to you or strep throat isn't a big deal to you but you don't know how it's going to affect another person uh who might be sitting next to you on the metro or on the bus or at the restaurant uh, and so i uh, think about those that you may not be able to see or may not realize are vulnerable but really are vulnerable uh and i think that is living out our pro-life calling uh, of caring for every every human being uh and saying that every human being is value and has dignity and should be protected. Uh, And that's what we're called to do in the pro-life movement. Thanks guys. 